Well, our passage is Mark 10, 35 to 45. I hope that you might have that open in front of you. There are so many aspects of Jesus' life which are not what we'd expect, are they? The Creator comes to the earth. And how does he come? As one of the creatures he has made, taking on their form and flesh. So the creator of the universe comes to earth. And how does he come? As a baby being laid in a feeding trough. The creator comes to his creatures, but they don't recognize him. The creator comes to his creatures to reveal himself but the creatures put the creator to death. It's not what you'd expect, is it? He comes to earth, says Mark 10, 45, not to be served, but to serve. It's the very opposite of what you'd expect. Uh, we'd expect the creator coming to his creatures would expect to be served, want to be served, demand to be served, to have all his needs and all his demands met uh, immediately, to be pampered, to be adored, to be bowed down to, to be honoured, to be waited on, to be hailed, to want to control everything, to give out commands, to expect nothing but complete submission, to be served all day, every day, whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it. Surely that's the greatness he deserves. He's the creator. Surely he came to be served. But no, he, he turns our expectations completely on their head. He says he came to serve. This whole passage turns our common thinking on its head, doesn't it? It begins with James and John wanting a favour, verse 35. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Whatever we ask, well, that could be anything. And it's a strange request, isn't it? Jesus has just told his disciples once again that he's going to up, up to Jerusalem where he'll be persecuted and killed and then rise again. And James and John come back and say, oh, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Like us saying to someone, great, do us a favour, will you? Without ever disclosing what that favour is. With great patience, Jesus asks, what is it you want me to do for you? In verse 37, have a look. They reply, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. So in their minds, they're thinking, when you, Messiah, come in and boot those Romans out of our, of our place, we want a piece of the action, Jesus. We want to share the kingdom and the power and the glory. Jesus says in verse 38, you don't even know what you're asking. The path to glory, Jesus explains, is the path of suffering. Verse 38 again. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Are you sure you know what you're asking? Jesus is thinking. Yes, they says in verse, they say in verse 39, we're with you, Jesus, we can do all that, not a problem. But Jesus assures them in verse 39 that they will in fact share in his suffering. And both James and John would share in martyrdom in due course. James within a few years, John 60 years down, down the track. But even so, the places of left and right will not be for him to grant. There is something so wrong about what James and John want, isn't there? Wanting power and status and authority, uh, wanting people to bow down to them, to respect them, wanting the glory. It, it's not a problem to confine to the disciples of the first century, is it? It's, it's greed and selfish ambition and pushing others out as you make your way to the top that is behind so much of the disputes and the financial upsets and the political instability and the corruption that we see right around the world. And it's this divisiveness that creeps into even our own homes as we insist upon our rights before those of others. But there is a great problem with such power, hungry, position jostling moves because it goes on just to to cause further division and conflict. And we see that 
right here because the question that James and John asks only goes on then to cause disunity, disruption, chaos amongst the relationships of the disciples. Verse 41, because when the ten is it, ten heard it, that is the other, the other part of the twelve, they began to be indignant at James and John. Indignant, probably outraged. Can you imagine the questions? Who do they think they are asking such a thing? Are they any better than us? Why should they have those positions? And all the time what they probably meant is why didn't we think of it first? So Jesus turns it into a teaching opportunity about the true nature of greatness or about the nature of true greatness and the somber note which they had to learn. And you and I need to learn and relearn is that being great has nothing to do with grasping a position of power. In fact, Jesus says, and this really would have given them something to think about, you know that those who are supposed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. In other words, wanting the power and the right to rule, that's for the Gentiles, that's for the unbelievers, that's for the pagans to worry about. And you are reaping the results of all of that as you suffer now under Roman rule for the last 25 years. That's their model. That's how, you, that's how you've lived. You're reaping the results of that kind of attitude. Leave that to the Gentiles. But in the kingdom of God, things are to be different. Among the people of God, things are to be different. It's to turn that on its head. Position jostling will be replaced with outdoing one another in service, in love, in being a slave to the other. The great one is not the one that looks to be served, but the one who looks first and foremost to serve. And that's about as opposite to 21st century living as it is to 1st century living. For right now, we're encouraged to get along to those seminars that help you to be yourself and to claim yourself and to find within yourself your own power to gain control over others, to be assertive, etc., rather than having others manipulate you for their own purposes. If we don't get to move ahead, then someone will be there to take our place. That's what we're told. That's how we're raised to live. Sadly, it can happen in the church as well, meaning both a denomination and and at local church where people want to insist on their rights and their ways and them receiving the recognition and the positions of power. But here is Jesus encouraging his disciples then and now to turn all that on its head. You want to be great? I'll tell you how to be great. It's not with grasping to be CEO, but with putting out the garbage. It starts not with wanting a position of power and all the greatness attached, but the position that no one else wants. It starts with the washing up. It starts with not gaining control, but relinquishing control. It starts with not wanting all the attention, but giving all the attention. It starts with not taking the position of power, but with washing feet. This can't help but challenge us, can it? We all like to be served by others, noticed by others. We want people to pander to our needs, our desires at least. We all do some of the time. We want some of the, the kudos, the claim to fame. We want people to revere us for something or other. We all like some power over others, even if it is only in our homes. Friends, the power is illusory, the fame is temporary, the glory is short-lived. And we know from elsewhere in Scripture that the whole exercise is in the end self-defeating because God brings down the proud but exalts the humble. The one who exalts themselves will be humbled and humiliated and the one who humbles themselves will be exalted. Now, we might ask, well, what right does Jesus have to teach these things? What insight does he have? What credibility? The superb example of his own service. For he caps off this teaching with the words in verse 
45, have a look with me. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus gives himself as the example, as one who, has, although has all the rights and all the authority in the world to be served, that he actually comes to serve. And where do we see that service that, that servant attitude at its, at its clearest? At his death. How is his death a service to you and to me? Because it's a ransom. We know, we know what a ransom is. It's a, it's a price paid to redeem or rescue something. A ransom means liberation. A liberation that the person could never have brought about for themselves. And the liberation that Jesus made possible for you and me that cost him his life, which he freely gave in the form of a shameful death on the cross. We have been wonderfully set free from sin and death, from evil and Satan, because Jesus served us. He rescued us gave his life as that ransom. He died as a substitute. We read in 1 Peter 2 that he himself bore our sin in his body on the tree. Or from 2 Corinthians 5, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And God tells us in the letter to the Philippians that Jesus did not cling on to his rights and riches of his eternal glory as the Son of God in the presence of his Father, but he gave it up to take on the form of a human and a slave at that, obedient all the way to the cross. That's the standard, Jesus says, in serving others. That's, that's the standard in becoming great through serving. That's the standard in seeking not to be served, but to serve. I want to ask you, have you invited Jesus to serve you in this way? That is... That's the first step in becoming a Christian, to acknowledge that you need rest, ransoming, rescuing, to acknowledge that you're in a very serious and dangerous position which you cannot dig yourself out of and then asking, therefore, Christ to serve you, to rescue you. And, of course, many stumble at just that point because it's a severe blow to the pride and, again, it cuts against 21st century thinking and sophistication to acknowledge actually that you have a problem that, that, that you can't solve yourself. Many people believe that if they can only just score enough points with God, they'll be put right with him. But oh no, it cannot be. It starts with allowing Jesus to serve you with admitting your sin, admitting that you've been serving you instead of serving God, that you've been the centre of your life, not him. And if you haven't asked Jesus to rescue you, to serve you, then you've not yet understood the wonder of the Christian faith, the nature, the very heart of the Christian faith. Have you been served by Jesus? Was it your place he took on the cross? Do you have new life because Jesus died for you, served you? Jesus said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And in so doing, he showed us what true greatness is all about. And friends, if we then are followers of Jesus, if we then are becoming more like him, then we too are becoming slaves of all. That's the very nature of our life. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. There is the path of greatness, serving others, whatever the need, whatever the cost. Is your life then, having received the most wonderful service of all in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, is your life then marked out by servanthood as you follow Jesus? Are you following Jesus in his footsteps as a servant of all? Or is there part of you? It's still looking for a bit of recognition and power for yourself. Are you wanting to serve, to help, to give, to love as a slave, as a nobody? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life 
as a ransom for many.